unraveling the mystery of marriage. I'm only trying to see how we can answer the question, what is marriage? And because I came up with an answer that marriage is a mystery, we want to see how we can unravel the mystery of marriage. We are going to take our text from the book of Ephesians chapter 5 where we are going to be reading from verse 21 up to verse 23. The epistle of Paul to the people of Ephesus. And we'll be taking chapter 5, where we read from verse 21 up to verse 33. All of us will read it together since they are projecting it for us. Shall we go together? Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Let's take verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Verse 28. So hot men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. No man ever yet ateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. Verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Verse 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverences her husband. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his word for the blessings of our families in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Did you notice that having read from verse 21 up to verse 30, we came to a point where the scripture says, therefore, a man will leave his father and his mother and shall be joined unto his wife. And they too shall be one flesh. And you know that talks about marriage. Amen. And then the Lord went ahead in the next verse. He said, this is what? 
a great mystery. I guess one of the reasons why people are not getting marriage right is the fact that marriage is a mystery. And you know that everything that is a mystery, you cannot understand it until you unravel it. Praise God. He said, this is a mystery that a man will leave his father and his mother and shall be joined unto his wife. And they too shall become one flesh. This is a mystery. So when you ask what is marriage, I said marriage is a mystery. So what is our prayer tonight? Lord, unravel the mystery for us. Amen. So we will only try tonight. We will see where God will help us to close it. Because they said we have one and a half hours. I don't know whether I've started. But you see, wherever we, when they ring the bell, we will stop. But I am praying you will understand this mystery. In the name of Jesus. You know why understanding it is a necessity? The Bible says, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. If there's a prayer I have prayed about this meeting, it is that fields will be lifted. Eyes will be opened. In the name of Jesus. You know the Bible says, and he opened their understanding that they may understand the scriptures. It's a mystery that a man will leave his father and his mother and shall be joined unto his wife. And they too shall become one flesh. So I say it is indeed a mystery that two individuals will become one flesh. So as we trust the Lord to unravel for us the mystery, what do we need to understand? So let's go. So the first matter, I said understanding marriage process one. Understanding marriage process one. And I brought it from this same scripture that we have read. He said, therefore, for tonight, I will not be able to look at the word therefore. But I want to move. He says, shall a man, everybody say a man. Can we say it again? So who is to marry? A boy or a man? Can I hear you? Eh? You know, the unfortunate thing is that some women, they marry a boy. And when you marry a boy, you will be frustrated because you will not behave like a man. So all our brothers that are wearing trousers, are you men or boys? For he says, therefore shall a man, a man, and it interests me that this issue of being a man is not a product of age. It is a product of maturity. For a person might have grown up in chronological age and is yet not a man. So may I first pray all our 
brothers. I don't want to call you men. Because I don't know whether you are men. But all our brothers that are looking at me, may you become men. In the mighty name of Jesus, let me look at your husband and tell him, be a man. <laughs> be a man. I don't know whether you have heard that before. That they are saying to somebody, be a man. Be a man. So who is a man? And I want you to note that this is a critical issue. There were a few things we just said there. Can we read the first one? We said, a man. You must first become a man. Someone who is matured enough to provide for himself the basic things of life without depending on others. As a man. When they say now you can marry, you're already a man now. You can marry. He is a person who has ability to provide. For he who cannot provide for his home is worse than an infidel. Do you know that every male child that is born is raised to be a provider? Once you give back to a child and you check the bonbon, and you see something that looks like a rod, you are giving back to who? A provider. So let me pray. Every power that says your male children will not be serious in life. May the Lord break that power. Brothers, every forces that will destroy your capacity and ability to provide for your home, may the Lord destroy that power. Whatever will reduce you to a man that is looking up to his wife before he can survive. That your children are asking for food and you are scratching your head. They are saying, hey, you know, your mother is not around. So, because your mommy is not around. And the children are saying, which mommy? Give us money. We can cook without money. You say, is that not what I'm talking about? I don't have money. It's your mother. That yoke is broken. In the mighty name of Jesus. Therefore, shall a man. That's why the devil is attacking the ability of men to be able to provide. In Genesis chapter 30, verse 30, Jacob said, When will I provide for my own home? He knew, he had an understanding that it is the responsibility of the man. He has to be a provider. Women are getting frustrated in our generation. When the husband who folds his hand and he's not doing anything. And it is the woman that is running from pillar to post. Yes, we know there is great challenge in the nation. People are losing their jobs and men in particular. But you know one thing with women is that even when they lose jobs, they are ready to use their hand to do something and generate income. But some men can be very proud. I was sharing with a couple in a the man had lost his job. The woman still had her home. But the woman had a car. She drives to the office every morning. And comes back in the evening with the car. So when she's going in the morning, she will carry passengers. When she's coming in the evening, she will carry passengers. So that in addition to the salary she, 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 she was earning, she could generate more money. So one day she woke up and said, my husband. Instead of waking up and sleeping every day. Yes, you have written several applications. Jobs are not coming. Why don't you drive me to the office in the morning? As you are returning home, carry passengers. When you are coming to pick me, give me, carry passengers. The man said, I find them. I find them. He said, no, 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 no. Not at my level. Which level? Which level? A woman is doing it. 
So when a man gets to know that as a man, you need to be able to provide. I don't know, but I just feel like praying for somebody. Whatever is attacking your capacity to provide for your home, the Lord scatter it. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. But somebody say, well, what if I'm a woman? And I need to say to you, gone are the days when women just say, no, I don't need to work. Once my husband gets a good job, I go just the job. Did I write something there? Let's read the second one. A woman is a contributor, not just a consumer. A woman. And it's interesting that in Genesis chapter 2, when the Lord was going to bring for the man, Genesis chapter 2, you may want to open your Bible. Genesis second chapter. Shall we look at verse 21? 22. Shall we read together? The Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Aha, uh -huh, verse 22. And the reed which the Lord God had taken from man made he. What did he make? Eh? He's a woman. She was matured and grown up. To have something she will be able to contribute. Be a contributor. Don't just be a consumer. In Songs of Solomon chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. Songs of Solomon chapter 8, verse 11 and verse 12. The bride of Solomon, the very first wife in the life of Solomon, the woman of Shulam, before Solomon went into error, and he started amassing wives like amassing garments. And I'm praying that the spirit of error that came upon Solomon will not come on your husband. Come on, look at your husband and prophesy to him. The spirit that came on Solomon will not come upon you. Look at your wife and tell her, I no go marry another wife. Tell him that they look you. <laughs> error came upon him. But before that spirit of error came, I want you to see the kind of home that they have. Look at verse 11. The woman said, Solomon had a vineyard where at Baal Hamon. He let out the vineyard unto keepers. Everyone for the fruit thereof was to bring a thousand pieces of silver. But look at verse 12. Everybody, verse 12. Shall we read it together? My Vineyard, which is mine. And those that keep the fruit, they are of 200. Come on, let me say to one woman that is sitting close to you that is not your wife. Tell her, the woman had her home vineyard. Let me say it to her very well. Don't be a barrack wife. I tell you this, even if your wife is not going to take a paid employment, please establish a business for your wife. Particularly in this Africa. That's the way by which a man dies and the family will pounce on the woman. And they say, you are the one that has been consuming all the money of our brother. Empower your wife to be able to generate something. The woman said, my vineyard, which is mine, is before me. You know that it's before me there. She was saying, I am monitoring it. I'm not a careless woman. That you will set up business for her and she will abandon it. 
my vineyard which is mine is before me. So I sell at capacity to generate something to contribute to the family. I want to prophesy every woman that is here. The Lord will empower you. I didn't hear your amen. I said the Lord will empower you. Because I was just thinking the woman in First Samuel chapter 25 the woman called Abigail the wife of Nabal First Samuel chapter 25 from verse 17 to 19 when David was angry with Nabal and David was coming with 400 soldiers intending to come and kill Nabal and every male in the family. You know that if Abigail had not been financially empowered, do you know that she would not be able to do anything without first going to her husband? Can we read the scripture please from verse 17? Everybody, let's go. Now, therefore, there is a servant. Listen, there is the servant of Nabat speaking to Abigail. The servant said, Ah, madam, madam, trouble is coming. Trouble is coming. David is coming with 400 soldiers. He has vowed that today your husband must die. And all the male in the family, he will kill all of them. Madam, madam, what are you going to do? So let's read what he said. Now, therefore, know and consider what thou wilt do. For evil is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. I don't know whether you understand. But you know it suggests to me that the servant was saying, so, mommy, you will be wasting your time to say you want to go and talk to him. Jay, you know your husband. Nobody can talk to him. This is not a time to talk. Take action. But excuse me, if the woman has no financial power, what action will she take? You know that the next thing will be her. Oh God, what type of trouble is this one now? What did you say David said? That David was asking for food. And why? Ah, how I wish. How I wish she would have died wishing. But you know what the Bible says? Let's read from verse 18. Then, can we read it together? Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn, and an hundred clusters of raisins, and two hundred cakes of figs, and laid them on asses. I want to pray. God will bless you. I didn't hear you. Amen. If you don't have something to contribute. Yes, you may not have a problem with your husband. But we pray that the man lives long. One of our brothers was working with Shep. Some people that are sitting down here may know. He was on cross posting to the U.S. And he died. Unfortunately. He had stopped his wife from working. And she was not doing any business. Of course, the woman was crying. Very young lady at that time. I'm not sure she was up to 28 or 29. Maybe the husband would be about 32 or there about. And the family in Nigeria started calling a young lady who just lost her husband and having two children to take care of. They kept calling and saying, eh, instruct 
the office of your husband in Nigeria to release money for the barrier. We learned they normally give money for barrier. Instruct them to give us money. The lady was crying. What type of family is this one? But every minute they kept calling. The members of the church in the US. They said, Look, don't let them kill you. Instruct the office to give them the money. That time was was long. Even then, the money was big money, just for burial. They collected it. The church in the US packaged the corpse for burial. They bought good casket, they brought the corpse. When they came down to Nigeria, hardly can you see what they have done with the money they collected. The burial was done. As soon as they finished the burial, the day of burial, they told her that she should not go home to her parents' house yet, that there will be a meeting. So at the meeting, they told this young sister. They said, the elder sister of your husband has gone to your husband's office to find out who is the next of king that he put there. And we have found out that it is you and our father. So we want you to tell us the day you will come. So that the two of you will go and process this entitlement. This lady was crying. Somebody just lost the husband. He just buried the man. The next thing family is thinking about. They have even sent somebody to go and find out. She was crying. She couldn't answer them. She just said they should give her time. As soon as they left the place, the members of the church that came with her from the U.S., because her husband was pastoring a church in the U.S., the members of the church said, No! My sister, this is a terrible family. We know that without you, because I guess she was the substantive next of kin. And then maybe the father or somebody else was the alternate. And they said they must see the two of them before any money can be released. The members of the church said, let the money remain there forever. Let's go back to the U.S. You will survive. She ran away. But listen, it took the support of brethren for her to start life all over again. He empowered let me look at one man that is sitting close to you. Don't look at me. Look at the men. Tell them, empower your wife. Empower your wife. Some of us so trust our family people. You say, ah, I trust my family. Which family? Now, because you never die. Some says, well, all my family people, all of them are born again. Ah, it is then you will know that they are born before. Empower your wife. Therefore shall a man. So a man, a woman is empowered. That's a third thing that I said there. I said that's an individual who is able to face life challenges without a recourse to his or her parents. That's a man. Does it not surprise you that the man called Goliath was standing before the army of Israel and he was bringing a challenge. What was the challenge? He was saying, give me a man. Just give me a man to fight with me. If he conquers me, we will be your slaves forever. If I conquer him, Israel will be our slave forever. I don't know whether it surprised you that in the whole of Israel, there was no man. Even Saul was a boy. Give me a man. Even Joab, the captain of the army, 
was not a man. They could not face challenges. And because of that, Goliath was boasting. So he will just say it, he will go and sit down. <laughs> we will wait for another time. He will come again. He said, give me a man. And all the brothers of David who were thought to be men of war, they were there, but none of them could appear. But praise God, there was a David. They thought he was a boy. He was a man. He was not sent to go and fight. What did they send him to go and do? Go and give food to your brothers. But he came across a challenge. And the man in him arose. And he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that is challenging the army of the Lord? I will go and fight with him. Even when Saul was saying, but you are a boy. And he has been a warrior from his birth. He said, no, king, you cannot understand. I am a man. I'm not just a boy. And he rose. There's somebody that is listening to me. The man in you will arise. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Now life is full of challenges. Marriage is full of challenges. It takes a man to be able to stand. So when I meet people who complain. And a woman is saying, sir. Actually, I'm getting frustrated in this marriage because every time I have a discussion with my husband, he will not, as in, he will not be able to make a decision. Then, in the evening, I will see him calling his mother, mother. So, <laughs> you know the problem, you marry a boy. You then marry a man. So he cannot face challenges without a recourse to his parents. It's the same way when you are married a girl and not a woman. You will keep complaining. I see men complain and say, Pastor, it is my father-in-law that is running our home. It is my mother-in-law that is running our home. My wife will be taking instruction from them before she will know what to do. So when we are talking about who is to marry, he said, a man, a woman. Hallelujah. That person has matured and grown up to be able to face life challenges without recourse to his or her parents. Again, I said, a person who is mature understanding. You know the Bible says in fighting you should be babies but in understanding you should be men. So a man is a person of great understanding. And you know that was what helped David while every other person were running away from Goliath. What made David to stand was that he had understanding. He said, look, this man you are running away from is an uncircumcised man. And he's defiling the army of the living God. There's something you don't understand about the living God. I faced a lion and a bear. They wanted to take the kid of my goat. And I took the lion. I took the bear. And I slaughtered them by the power of God. And he said, the God who gave the lion and the bear into my hands, he will give this uncircumcised Philistine. He does understanding. Man is somebody that has understanding. I am prophesying tonight. The man in you will arise. Madam, the woman in you will arise. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And you know that was what also marked out Abigail in that first Samuel chapter 25. When the Bible described her in verse 3, first Samuel 25, she was a woman of 
good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. You may begin to wonder why they said that. A woman of good understanding. Hallelujah. A woman of what? Good understanding. Why did they say that? I'll show you the number one. When the servant reported to her, if you notice what we read in verse 17, when the servant reported and said, Madam, he who is determined against our master, and you better know what you are going to do. You know our master is a son of Belial, that nobody can talk to him. You know that if she was not a woman of good understanding, what will she do for that servant? Eh? You first slap him and say, what do you call my husband? My husband, son of Belia, in your mouth? But excuse me, was he trying to insult David? No, are you talking? Was he trying to insult David? No. It takes a woman of understanding to be able to decode what that man was saying. How did I know she was a woman of good understanding? She needed not consult her husband at that point to know what to do. She had initiative. She could reason out quickly. What do I do to solve the problem? So she moved into action. A woman of good understanding. And the Bible says she did not tell her husband. Why? Because again by understanding she knew that if you go and talk to him, he will not allow me to go and solve the problem. He will cause more problems. He will start shouting. Good understanding. When she returned and as she was coming back, she was thinking, hey, God, I thank you. Oh, thank God that I moved very fast. Hey, husband would have died today. Ah, this man, eh, this is mouth. Eh, the man, the way they used to insult me. Go, 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 carry that mouth. Insult David. Hey, God, I need to go and warn him. As she came, the man was already drunk. Drunk. <laughs> you they look. Just see they laugh. Why they make you laugh? That discouraging of barbarism. I think something is emancipating your internal exigency and abdominal refrigerator. He was drunk. And Abigail came. Do you know that if she was not a woman of good understanding, she will start fighting a drunkard. You say, hey, me, I go take my hair, block the death, we won't kill you. Now drink you, they drink. I for leave them, say, may they kill you. Yeah, yeah, man. And you see, when you are talking to a drunkard, a drunkard will dress you down. The man will say, yes. I know, say, I be yeah, yeah, man. But your papa, na yeah, yeah, man. Your grandfather, where don't die, na yeah, yeah, man. Your mama, na yeah, yeah, man. Then you will get angry again. You say, ah, you did abuse my father. <laughs> you abuse my father. And you talk. He will say more. But because she was a woman of good understanding, as soon as she saw that the man was drunk, the Bible said she said nothing. I've seen a lot of you women. You talk when you are supposed to keep quiet. And you are creating more problems for yourself. A man is already angry. You are talking. When will you gain understanding? When will you mature? When will you become a woman? For it takes a woman to keep a home. Not just a girl. So the fact that you carry two breasts and you carry something under you has not made you a woman. There must be maturity. That you are able to have a control to understand what to do per time so that you don't run yourself into trouble. So again, a person who is matured in understanding. Now, I go further. Understanding marriage process. We are still there. Understanding marriage process. I said, as a man, you don't argue. 
you put your emotion of anger under control. A man does not argue. So once I enter into a marriage and I see a man arguing with his wife, I say, this is a boy. A man does not argue. A man controls his anger. Once I get into a marriage and I see a man who gets angry and is boiling and they are begging you to hold you say, no, 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 no. No, please, pastor, I respect you. Please, please, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. But hmm, I'm going to show her. I'm going to show her. I say, ah, this is a boy. A man does not argue. And he keeps his emotion at bay. He's in control of his emotion. Even when the wife is shouting and shouting and shouting, you want to shout. People say, ah, ah, are you a woman? I bet be a man. Don't answer her. You say, no, 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 no. If I don't answer her, she will think she's smart. She will think she's smart. Then you become a woman. And so when you are reading in 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 8, he said, I wish that men will pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without argument and without anger. That's the way I want men to be. They don't get angry. They control their emotions. See men misbehaving. That a man will get so angry, beat the wife to coma. Beat a woman and tear her clothes. Get angry. Even the children that want to say, ah, daddy, don't beat our mommy, don't beat our mommy. Kick his own child. And one did that in Quara State. The intestine of the boy came out. Kicked by the father. takes a man to marry. And God wants you to be a man. And I want to pray. Your girls will marry correct men. Even if you have made a mistake, they will not make the mistake you have made. You say you see a man and then everybody will be going to beg him and beg him and beg him about a matter. The wife has met pastor, has met elders in the church. They keep going to beg the same man. I said, no, uh, no, no. Not be say I hungry, but <clears throat> no, no. And you're not saying anger in your heart. That spirit will get out of your life. <clears throat> As a man, you do not cry over every little matter like a woman. If every little thing, your husband is always crying, you are in trouble. If it's your wife, they'll be saying, ah, ah. Now, if you are crying like this, what do you want me to do? What do you say? Why will I not cry? <laughs> I can't control myself. And then somebody is going to say, ah, please be a man now. Be a man. Don't cry. <laughs> be a man. It is because men are expected to be able to manage situations. You don't cry over every little matters. Like a woman. As a man. You are able to say sorry. To an offended or aggrieved person. Even when you do not know what you have done. Wow. I know some women will be thinking now. Ah. Pastor say it well. As with the same husband. I never know how to say sorry sir. Sorry, no days dictionary. But a man is able to say sorry even when he does not know what he has done. Then there was a message I was reading. A WhatsApp post. And they said one boy went to his father. And he said, Dad, I just want to tell you. I just have to inform you. I want to wait this year. 
The father said, you want to marry? The boy said, yes. The father said, say sorry to me. The boy said, for what? The father said, did you hear me? Say sorry to me. The boy said, what have I done? Dad, I don't understand. The father said, say sorry to me. The boy said, but I need to know what I've done. If I don't say sorry, I don't know what I've done. I may do it again. What have I done? I'm telling you I want to marry. Is it an offense? The father said, say sorry to me. And the father was stern. They were arguing back and forth. But it got to a point, the boy just said, and why is my father doing like this? So he just said, okay, dad. Even though I don't know what I've done, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The father said, now you can marry. The boy said, but dad, I don't understand. The father said to him, there are many times when women get angry unnecessarily. If you don't know how to say sorry to them, they will cry to you tomorrow. So if you are going to be a man, you must be a person who can say sorry to your wife when she's angry with you and you don't know what you have done. You don't come and start asking her, why are you crying now? No, excuse me, what have I done? That question is irrelevant. <laughs> I mean, it's not relevant. Just go and say sorry. And many of us have to be taught how to say sorry to a woman. It is not as if you stand like a soldier. You are saying, ah, this guy don't start again. Sorry, oh. I say sorry. Or what else do you want? That's not how to say sorry to a woman. She's hungry. She feels offended. Even when you think you have not done anything, move close to your wife. Hold her to yourself. Hold her. And say, please, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. And you know the nature of a woman. If she's really angry, as you are holding her, she will say, oh, leave me alone. Leave me alone. Oh, God. Even that your hand is a pain in my body. Leave me alone. But do you know that you must not leave her? Oh, God. <laughs> because that leave me alone, she doesn't mean it all. Women, do you mean it? Talk. <laughs> she doesn't mean it. That's why you will know a man. She said, oh, leave me alone. Take your hand away from my body. <laughs> it's the opposite, eh? <laughs> she said, hold me well. <laughs> so you don't leave her. Because if you leave her, you will cause another problem. She will now say, aha. Uh -huh. I know that all the begging you are begging me, you don't mean it. Because if you mean it, why did you leave me? If I say, but, you are the one that says I should leave you. Oh God. You see, that is why it takes a man of understanding to marry a woman. You know, when you are reading 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. He said, you should deal with them according to knowledge. As if God is saying, you need to know some things about women. So it takes a man of understanding, a man of knowledge, to be able to keep a wife. So as a man, you are able to say sorry when your wife feels offended even though you do not understand what you have done. So I prophesy tonight the man in you will arise in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. So some of you men that are looking at me that sorry is not in your dictionary. I write it there now with capital letter. <laughs> In the name of Jesus Christ. And I hope you know that actually sorry does not reduce you. Actually, 
ability to say sorry is a sign of maturity. It is a matured person who says sorry for peace to reign. That makes you a man. Understanding marriage process number two. Now what I've been talking about is a man. I want to move quick. He said, a man shall leave. A man shall leave. A man shall leave. So let's read the first thing that comes under that one. Let's read it together. There must be a living. When there is no proper living, there can be no total cleaving. Leaf. The word leaf is inside cliff. So a man who does not leave his father and his mother cannot cliff to his wife. Unfortunately, there are several, several men who find living very difficult. There are several women who find living very, very difficult. What does it mean to live? Can we read the first one there? We said to live could mean to effect a geographical change in location from one parent's house. I'm no longer living with my parents. I leave. I leave. But do you know that it is possible to change your graphical location and yet you have not left? So, number three there, the third thing there now says to leave could mean to detach from parental control. Or parental manipulation, whether or not there is a change in location. There are people that don't have a choice, that their parents have to live with them. But yet, the parents are not controlling, are not manipulating their life or their home. And yet, there are people who have changed location. They live far away from their parents. And yet, it is their parents controlling them. So several years back, I was talking to a woman. And she was crying. What was the issue? Her parents lived in Oshun State, the capital, Oshobo. Herself and her husband lived in Wari, in Delta State. But according to her, every time she has a meeting with her husband and they discuss, they agree on things they want to do. Sometimes they will do meeting till 12 midnight before they sleep. And they would have agreed, we will do this next week, we will do this in two weeks time. By the time the husband goes to work the following morning, when he returns, all the decisions they made would have changed. She would just be reminding him what about this thing we say we want to do? We say, no, no, no. I don't think we're going to do it yet. I don't think. Ah, but that was not what we agreed. It was later she discovered that once the husband gets to work the following day, he will call his mother and say, actually, I had the meeting with my wife yesterday. These were the things we discussed. And these are the things we have agreed that we are going to do. Then the mother will say, oh, that's okay. Don't do it yet. I will be coming to worry in three weeks time. We will look at it together. We will decide what we will do. Is he a man or a boy? Okay, small boy. The mother will go and visit them. Because this woman was actually crying. She said, sir, once my mother-in-law come to visit, I dress up in the morning, I'm going to work. My husband dress up in the morning, going to work. My mother-in-law will come and meet my husband. 
and say, remember to leave the key of your room. And my husband will say, oh, yes, I forgot it. And he will carry the key of their matrimonial bedroom and give to her. To do what? We put you in a room. But the husband cannot say no. When the wife raises it as an issue, you say, no, 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 that's my mother. That's my mother. Of course, you know women now. You know what we follow. No problem. When you want to sleep in the night, call your mother into the room. <laughs> yes, now, so that we know who is the wife in this house. So, look, to live is to detach from parental control or manipulation. So, if there are men that are looking at me now and you have not been able to detach, may the Lord grant you grace tonight. If there are women who have not detached, you are not detached. It is your parent that's swinging you. And it is to whatever direction they swing you. May the Lord change you tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. A man shall leave his father and his mother. For it is only then he can cleave to his wife. But you know we quickly put something there. And it is deliberate. Because if we don't put it, I know that when some women get home tonight, they will say, aha, uh -huh. I thank God that both of us were at that meeting. And I really thank God for that man of God. He was emphasizing it. Leave! That man was shouting, leave! So I want you to leave that your father and your mother. Leave! As in, I don't want to see them again in this house. Leave! And so, so that we don't run into trouble. What did we write there? Can we read it together? To leave does not mean to abandon. You are not to abandon your parents because you have a responsibility to take care of them. You are not to abandon your parents because you have a responsibility to take care of them. Help me face your wife, face your husband. Don't look at another person. Face your home well. Face your home. Just keep looking at your home. Tell and say, they know see make I abandon them. <laughs> they know see make I abandon them. Because it's not abandonment. You are not supposed to abandon your parents. You have a responsibility to take care of them. And I hope you know that once you get married, your parents become four. Except any of them is dead. Who are they? Number one. Your father, number two. Your mother, number three. Your father-in-law, number four. They are your parents. And you have a responsibility to take care of them. If your father is dead and your mother is dead, like my home, you told them, they are gone. But my mother-in-law is still alive. That's my mother. If I put a call across now, she will not allow me to talk. She will just be praying from Genesis to Revelation. I should say, you are not my son-in-law. You are my son. You have a responsibility to take care of them. First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5. Let's read verse 3 and verse 4. First Timothy, chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. You have a responsibility to take care of them. First Timothy, chapter 5, verses 3 
chapter 4. Shall we read together? One, two, go. Honor widows that are widows indeed. Aha. Uh -huh. Verse 4. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, they should learn to. I didn't hear us. Everybody. Let, okay, King James. Let them learn first to shield piety at home and to requite their parents. For that is good and acceptable before God. Give us another translation that you have. I know you don't have New Living Translation. You don't have contemporary English version. I think there's another one you have. Okay, let's read this one together. Verse 4, everybody. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, they should learn to practice their religion toward their own family first and to repay their parents for this pleases God. How many of you still have parents? Whether one over four or two over four or three over four or four over four. You still have parents. Can I see your hand up? You don't have any other one. The two of you. The four of them are gone. Kafka. You still have parents. Can I see your hand up? Please look at the person that is raising up hand beside you. Just look at them. Help me tell that person you are a debtor to your parents. You must pay them. You are a debtor to your parents. You must do what? Did you see that they use the word repay? Repay. I want to say to you, even if your parents are comfortable, God still expects you to do what? Repay. Let me ask us, can we finish repaying them? Eh? What if I build house for them? Have I finished paying? I buy car for them. Have I finished paying? You can't finish paying them. The case of a young man always give me concern. He lived overseas for many years. And he never for once allowed his mother to visit him to the woman die in Nigeria. Then he brought big money to come and bury her. He will not take the mother even once. The same thing. Till his father entered the grave, he did not for once. Of course, in his family, everybody happened to be against the wife because they feel that it must have been the wife preventing them. Because the father of the wife was going. The mother of the wife was going. The brothers of the wife, they were going. Let me look at one woman that is not your wife. Look at her that is not your wife. Don't look at me. Look at one woman. Let me tell her, don't block your husband from repaying his parents. Don't block him. Let me look at one man. That is not your husband. Don't look at me. Look at one man. Look at them. Tell him, say, your wife also gets people. Take care of them. <laughs> you know, because some men, it is their own family they go to face. But you know, to leave does not mean to abandon. God said, you have a responsibility. To repay them. I used to pity these African people. My mother died March 24. And I said, with the trend of this corona thing, March 24 was Tuesday. I said, let's go and bury her on Saturday. Let's bury her on Saturday. One year later, we will go to church to go and do Thanksgiving. All of us. Some of my siblings say, no. Ah, our mother suffered for us. So we must do something. something. I say, ah, with the way this corona thing is going, we don't know when lockdown we hook us. They did not answer me. The following Monday, 
lock down, lock the dead body of my mother in Ondo State. You want to bury her in Oyo State. No movement. So no problem. We waited. You know when this thing started is all those people that were saying, hey, hey, we must do something. They now went and do budget. They now say that they don't have money now. <laughs> He said, he said, Reverend Mike and Reverend, my other brother, that we should look for the money for them. When everything is, they will pay back. I said, eh, maybe you are the one that wants to bury your mother. That's Africa. The woman, they did not borrow money to take care of. They are ready to borrow money to bury you. Sometimes I used to wish that God should be permitting dead people to be attending their burial. <laughs> that God should just give permission to people that are dead to attend their own burial. So that as you are dancing, the woman go, they follow you. Say, hey, you get money for cow. I die in suffering. As you are dancing, something will just eat your head. Bah! You say, yeah, yeah, yeah. They say, what thing happened? You say, I don't know. We need to take care of them when they leave. You know, we have problem in Africa. Our problem is that when we do big barrier, people think we have done something great. They say, Kai, they spent money on the burial of their father. Ah, the head of that father will bless them. It's a lie. Whatever blessing, your father does not bless you before he dies. It has entered coma. Whatever blessing, your mother does not bless you before she dies. It has sent her voicemail. It can't come out. And you will understand that in Genesis chapter 27. Can we quickly read something? In Genesis 27. In Genesis 27. I read from verse 1. And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his elder son and said unto him, My son. And he said unto him, Behold, there am I. And he said, Behold now, I'm old. I know not the day of my death. Now therefore, take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, and go out to the field. And take me some Venetians. Shall we all read verse 4 together? If you have opened it in your Bible. Verse 4 of that Genesis 27. One to go. And make me, savory me, such as I love. And bring it to me, that I may eat. That my soul may bless thee. When? So when can the soul of your father bless you? Please, can you talk to me? When can the soul of your mother bless you? When can the soul of that father-in-law bless you? When can the soul of that mother-in-law bless you? It is why they leave. It is why they leave. If you don't do it, why they are still alive? And then you are gallivanting around, borrowing money and buying clothes. And you go and tie, tie one something on your head. And you go and put one publication inside punch. It's when we get to the graveside. <sighs> Mama. <laughs> Mama. <laughs> Mama, don't sleep. Oh. Don't sleep. Remember me. Oh. Remember your brother. Remember your brother. Remember. 
Which mama? She has gone. Whatever blessing she has not released upon your life. So the father of Esau said, do it now. Let me hear that my soul, and I love that, that even if I don't open my mouth to bless you, the fact that I have eaten from your hand, my soul, I feel like asking somebody here, what is it that you still need to do for that your mother-in-law? That her soul may bless you before she dies. What is it that you still need to do for that your father-in-law? What is it that you still need to do for that your mother, for that your father? That their soul may bless you before they die. If you don't do it, and they are dead, and you start distributing umbrella to the people that come for burial, you are a murderer. It's as if you are just saying, ah, thank you, oh, thank, for, thank you for coming. My enemy don't go. Take umbrella. I don't see the end of my enemy. Oh, thank you. And you are distributing. What will they hit from your hand before they die? And so when we say leave, that a man shall leave, it is not that he will abandon his parents. The woman, you don't abandon your parents. You don't marry a wife and detach her from her family. Some men are wicked. He wants to visit his own family every month. The wife cannot visit her parents. When God expects that you will join hands with your wife to take care of her people, you will join hands with your husband to take care of his people because they have become your people. Understanding marriage process number three. Understanding marriage process number three. By just trying to unravel. It says, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined. Everybody say, and shall be joined. Can we say it again? And shall be joined. Can we read the first one? We said, no joining, no marriage. If there is no joining, there is no marriage. So if pastor stand up and say, look, in this church, once you have not been joined in marriage, you cannot be a worker in the church. Once we cannot see evidence that you are joined, you don't start saying, hey, all this law, where then they make? All this law, where then they make? If there's no joining, if you are just doing cohabitation, cohabitation, there's no marriage. There must be joining. If you look at the way it is put in that Ephesians chapter 5. When we read and he said, For this cause, verse 31, Shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined? Did you notice that he didn't say, For this reason, Shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall join his wife? What did he say? Shall be joined. What is the difference between shall join his wife and shall be joined unto his wife? Do you know that shall be joined unto means that there is a third party that is responsible for the joining. Hallelujah. <laughs> it is not that I impregnate her. Then she carry load. Paper bag marriage. And he can't join me. That's not marriage. Such a man who keeps a woman like that is actually a kidnapper. So all you men that are looking at me, did you marry your wife or you kidnap her? Every man must answer three questions. Question number one. When did they join you with your wife? 
Question number two, who joined you with the woman? Question number three, where did they join you? Can we give the three questions now? Number one, when were you joined? Question number two, who joined you? Question number three, where, where did they take place? Somebody just give you belay, you carry Lila, you go meet her. Your parents push your head. They say, as you don't get belay now, now we go take care of you, take care of belay. How we go do it now? Yeah, you know the person will give you belay. You say, I be kid, why no go no now? Why no go no? I don't tell you, say that somewhere. They say, we say, is it somewhere for our church now? I say, okay. We will call somewhere parents. Then you carry load. Sometimes I they pity women. As you will go and meet him, you will now be begging him. After, he will say, when you born, finish. You go settle. When you born. As you born now, you go the beggar. Eh? My parents, then they worry me now. They say, make you come pay my diary. You know what I'm saying? What can I go do now? I don't get money. As money no day now. What can I go do? Money no day, he will give you second belly. Money no day, third belly. You don't bomb four children. Who is wicked between the two of you? Not the man or not the woman. Who is foolish? Not the woman. So a wicked person, marry foolish person. Because if the first one a mistake, what do we go call the second one? Okay, now mistook. <laughs> what do we go call him? A man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined. So there must be joining. If there is no joining, then there is no marriage. And we said there, joining can take place either through the native law and custom or through the marriage act, which could take place either in the church or at the registry. One must be done. There must be joining. So if you are looking at me now, and every time they say, let all married women stand up in church and you stand up but you have not been joined let all married men stand up and you normally stand up God is saying something now you need to go and correct your marriage there must be joining go and regularize your relationship and shall be joined unto his wife So we said here, traditional wedding is critical and it is important as it creates the avenue for two things. What's the number one? Parental consent. What's the number two? Parental blessing. Nobody should dodge traditional marriage. It must be done. It's a necessity. So when I see people that says, hey, I've spoken to my daddy and my mommy. If they will not agree for me to marry the person I want to marry, no problem. We will leave them. We will go to court. You don't do that. Because if you do it, even God will not back up your marriage. The traditional marriage must be done. But the only thing is that when we are doing traditional marriage, we must run away from idolatrous practices. You don't do anything that is against God. Again, having said that, church wedding that we now put there, I said, this is not only critical, it is important, but it is more beneficial as it affords you the privilege of pastoral biblical counseling and guidance and divine impartation through pastoral and corporate congregational prayers. 
it is very critical. It is also built on the background of parental consent and blessing. So the church wedding is on embracing. No church will join you. The pastor will ask, who give this woman to be joined in marriage unto this man? They are talking about parental consent. Have you done the traditional? It is on that basis the church will wed you. And the church wed people have been received directly from the registry. And so that's why one of the certificates of the church also returns to the registry. Hallelujah. But you know the key thing about church wedding is that it has to do with pastoral guidance, biblical counseling, and spiritual impartation of grace. Not only from the pastor, but also from the congregation of the people of God. And so I closed there. I said, those who may seize it often arrange for church marriage blessing, which ought not to be done without proper counseling on God's standard of marriage. So listen to me, pastor. Look up. Even when people come and they say, hey, because we don't do wedding before, we don't go our village now. We don't go pay the money we're supposed to pay. We want to do marriage blessing in church. They must still do counseling. Even if they have been married for 30 years. Because they need anybody that cannot do it. You can't come and do church blessing. If I take people that want to marry through six weeks of premarital counseling, you still have to go through it. Because the standard of marriage you have been following before is not the standard of God. So now we need to teach you what is God's standard about how to manage finance in marriage? What is God's standard about how to raise children in marriage? What is God's standard about communication in marriage? What is God's standard about conflict resolution in marriage? What is God's standard? Every area. We take them through. If somebody say, ah, ah, pastor, <laughs> why nobody say, I just marry now? We don't be on this canceling, canceling. I beg go. <laughs> if not canceling, make we keep your church blessing. No problem. But you want us to bless you, then you need to subject yourself to canceling. So that you can start afresh. Hallelujah. And I don't think that should be difficult for anybody. Abraham was 99 years old. When he encountered God afresh. And God said. If you know you are going to walk with me. You have to be circumcised. Excuse me. At what age do you normally circumcise children? Eh? It's this. How do you circumcise a 99 years old man? You know, two questions came to my heart. Will he remove his trouser? And his pants. 99 years old. Naked himself. You know the second question that came to my heart? Who is the person <laughs> that we carry knife? And say, Baba, stand right. This God there eh, is too much. And yet, because Abraham wanted to work with God, did he cooperate? So some of you that are looking at me, if you didn't start your marriage right, and God is challenging you now, will you be humble enough to say, God, I will do your will. How I wish that if there's a man here tonight that you did not marry your wife properly, that you get home tonight and you beg your wife and you say, Kai, as that pastor, they speak, they think they touch me. This is September. November, I will go and pay your bride price. You know how the woman will feel? She say, Nalai! Ah! Oh God! <laughs> will you do more Tina? Every woman is looking for it. Normalize our relationship. Let's go and do it. Let's come back to church. Let's tell pastor, carry him along. Let pastor do counseling for us. We want to start afresh. And for Abraham, 
It was a privilege. And that caused a turnaround in the situation of his life. The Lord will grant you grace in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Can I see hit something? I hope you didn't go up to go and give me a signal that time. I didn't look up. Because when you were coming down, I said, Kai, I'm sure it was because of me this man climbed upstairs. Don't worry. Let me hit one more thing. We're going to close. Understanding marriage process number four. When we come in tomorrow, we'll continue. Process number four. He said, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined unto his wife. A man shall be joined unto his wife and they too. So what's the first thing we said there? God's plan is one man, one wife. One man, one wife. He said, therefore shall a man be joined unto his wife, not wives. So let me prophesy over the life of all our brothers that are here. The spirit of polygamy will not enter your heart. If I think you need to turn to your wife, all the men stop writing now. Look at your wife. Let me promise your wife. No second wife. Talk, 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 talk. Talk. Tell her, no second wife. Tell your wife, I am satisfied with you. Now you and me till death do us part. No second wife. Because it's against the will of God. When you read Genesis 20, chapter 2. From verse 21. I think we should read it. Genesis chapter 2. And from verse 21. The Bible says. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took how many of his ribs? One of his ribs. And closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he. How many women? How many women? A woman. And brought them. Eh? Is it hard that is there or them? How many did he bring? Help me face your husband down. Don't look at another man. Tell him, say, now let me God bring to your life. Now let me God bring to your life. If any other person come, now Satan bring him. <laughs> any other man, any other lady that want to enter your life is from where? Is from the devil. when I was in a church and one person wanted to trick me he said sir you know that the bible says those that God has joined together let no man put asunder but sir it's not God that joined me with my wife because I married her when I didn't know God <laughs> I said so what do you want to do now I want to leave her so that God will not join me to the person you want. I said, I lie. Even if Naisa shrine, then join you. You don't join. <laughs> you don't join. One man, one wife. So when you are reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Now, concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Verse 2, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication. 
let every man have what? Wives? His own wife. And let every woman have what? Her own husband. One, one. Let me look at your husband. Don't look at me now. Look at where we're. Tell him. Look at. Madam, no be your husband. Look at. Tell him, I am sufficient to meet all your sexual desire. You don't need another woman. Tell him. <laughs> because I don't know what you are looking for. I don't know what you are looking for. One man, one woman. Polygamy is an aberration. It was brought in after the fall of man by one man that they call Lamech. Unfortunately, Lamech was from the tribe, from the family of Cain. Lamech himself was a murderer. He was the first person in Genesis chapter 4 to marry two wives. And people started copying him. People started following him. That spirit that enter Lamech will not enter your husband. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And I said as I close here, the Bible gave records of some polygamists to show the problems associated with polygamy. Because sometimes some people will say, hey, but excuse me sir, if God is against polygamy, but there are polygamists in the Bible. Yes. They were written for us to learn that there is danger in polygamy. I can trace a little. Do you remember that the family of Abraham was a peaceful family until Agai came in? And that family became something else. Sarah, who we call her husband, Lord, who we never lift up her eyes to look at Abraham. Sarah started saying, no, this woman must get out of this house. The home was in trouble. Leave Abraham alone. Move further. And consider a man like Jacob who had four wives. The family of Jacob was a terrible family. Very terrible. That's a home where you will see serious competition. Even the naming ceremony of children. The name they will be giving their children is a name for fighting. Somebody will say, I'm going to name my child God. Which means plenty troops are coming to fight you. <laughs> oh God. The other one will give back. You see, you go and read your Bible. Very, very terrible thing. And it was very interesting that it was the women that were giving names to the children. Leave that family alone and move ahead to the family of Solomon. The Bible says the women turned his heart away from God. Move away from that family and look at the family of David. The son of one woman will rape the daughter of another woman. The brother of the one that is raped will say, I'm going to kill my stepbrother for what he has done. It was a family of sorrow. All the polygamists you will read in the Bible, God wrote them, God put them there so that those who have wisdom will learn that polygamy is evil. It is evil. I came from a polygamy. I know it is evil. I have seen things. So if there's any man that is looking at me, and you're already considering marrying another wife, Satan has entered your brain. God will kick him out. In the mighty name of Jesus, there's no joy in polygamy. There's no peace in polygamy. Polygamy is evil. 
Let me close by saying to the women, don't do anything that will push your husband to start considering another wife. Because as we are doing counseling, when all those men start talking, I say, actually, Pastor, I didn't plan it. I didn't plan it, actually. But you know, my wife, ah! Hold on, hold on. And they'll be talking about the woman. That she's the one that pushed me out. So all these women that are looking at me, don't push him out. Don't push him out. Don't push him out. And all the men that are looking at me, if they are pushing you, don't move. <laughs> Shall we stand up to pray? Because I don't want you to get up tonight and say, aha, you know that pastor was saying it. You are pushing me. You are pushing me. If I go out, you are the one that push me. If they are pushing you into the bush and you are not an animal, will you go? Shall we close our eyes tonight? I'm going to sing to God. Do something new in my home. Something new in my home. We're going to sing it two times and you will pray for yourself. I want to become a brand new wife. I want to become a brand new husband in the hand of my wife. Lord, start something new. With these issues that you are raising for us, I want you to start something new in my home. Do something new in my home. Something new in my home. Something new in my home. Oh, Lord, do something new in my home. Something new. Something new, do something new in my home. Something new in my home. Something new in my home. Oh, do something new, do something new in my home. pray and you just turn it to God Lord start something new in my life in the life of my husband in the life of my wife we want to renew our marriage from tonight we want to start afresh Lord we want to start anew oh God Lord begin something new Lord begin something new Lord begin something new let the man in me arise tonight let the woman in me arise tonight, O oh God. Every understanding that I need to keep my home, every understanding that I need to run my marriage, Lord, release upon me tonight. Lord, I am beginning anew. I am beginning afresh. In the name of the Lord Jesus, you will help me, Lord. 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 Lord, you will help me. I receive grace for a new beginning. I receive grace for a fresh start. Release that grace upon me. Release that grace upon me, Lord. Release that grace upon me, Lord. I receive the grace to cleave to my wife. To cleave to my husband. Lord. Lord I receive that grace. Grace to cleave. Grace to cleave. To cleave is to bond together. 
To cleave is to experience emotional bond. To cleave is to experience spiritual bond. Lord, release that grace upon us. We want to cleave afresh tonight. Release that grace upon our lives. Release that grace upon our lives. Oh, Rebo Soporia Malagabayataria. Yengre Lebo Sheketeria Malabalabalaba. Repuske Teke Lebo Supragabalabalaba. I want you to pray tonight. Lord, bless me to take care of my parents. Bless me to take care of my parents. Bless me, Lord. Bless me to take care of my in laws. Bless me, Lord. I want to be a blessing to them while they leave. I want to be a blessing to them while they leave. Bless me, O oh God. Bless me, O oh God. I will not abandon them. I will not ignore them. I will not abandon them. Lord, you will bless me. Bless me to bless them. Yes, if you are here, you are not yet joined in marriage. Bright price you did not pay. You need to pray and say, God, help us to go and correct the foundation of our marriage. We receive grace tonight to go and correct it. We receive grace tonight, Lord, to go and correct it. Release that grace upon our lives. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. I want you to take this final prayer for tonight. We'll continue from there tomorrow. We are going to refuse every spirit that we want to make your marriage to become a polygamist marriage. You are going to pray as a woman. If there is any strange man that is trying to enter the life of my husband, Lord, block them out. You are going to pray as a man. I will not fall into the hand of another woman. If polygamy is a cause in my family, that cause is broken in my own life. If it is a covenant in my family, I reject that covenant in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I will not end up a polygamist in the mighty name of Jesus. I will not end up a polygamist in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh Lord, every plan of the devil to push any man in this meeting into polygamy. We cancel that plan. We frustrate that cancel. In the mighty name of Jesus. Lord God Almighty we pray. Any strange woman that have been raised from the pit of hell. To pull any man here down. Lord scatter their plans. Destroy their intention. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you mighty father. In Jesus mighty name we are praying i guess there's one more prayer we should pray it interests me when god said nevertheless in that first corinthians chapter 7 verse 2 he said nevertheless to avoid fornication let every man have his own wife let every woman have her own husband and i said it as if it was a joke that it means that as far as God is concerned, you need only a wife to satisfy all your sexual hunger. You don't need any other woman. You are going to ask God. The spirit of immorality will not enter my husband. We want to pray for men. Listen. And I want the women to pray. If you need help me pray for your husband. You see, the Bible says that the adulteress will be hunting for the precious life. If the life of your husband is precious, there's an adulteress that is hunting for him. I didn't know, Pastor. But the one woman looked at him. And she says, Sir, if not because of the anointing of God on your head, if not because of the ministry, you are the kind of person I would have loved to keep as a friend. I said, eh? He said, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about sex. Or somebody I can hug. Somebody I can lean on. Somebody I can say, eh? Yeah? Where does sex begin from? There's an adulteress that is hunting for your husband. May they never get him. And if they're already getting him and you don't know, he has been doing this secretly. 
we scatter them tonight. Open your mouth and begin to pray in the name of Jesus. Marebo sokotoria maliga baya la katariaba. Le peke seketoria. Lingra baya bala balaba. Come on, pray tonight. I will not fall into the hand of the adulteress. In the mighty name of Jesus, oh God, you will keep me by your power. You will sustain me by your grace. In the mighty name of Jesus, the Bible says, He that thinketh he stand, let him take it lest he falls. I want you to pray, oh God, I will not fall, I will not stumble. In the name of Jesus, the adulteress will not get me. I pray for all our brothers in this service that Lord, the adulteress will not get them. In the name of Jesus. If there's any man here tonight that you are under the bondage of an adulteress, we lose you tonight. We release you tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus. We break the yoke tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus. We break the yoke tonight. Every spirit of, of confectiousness, I bind it. I cast it out. Spirit of confectiousness that make you to convert other ladies. I bind that spirit. I cast it out in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Our Father, we thank you tonight. Thank you for bringing us to this point. You said the word that has proceeded out of your mouth is like rain that come upon the ground that give seed to the sower and bread to the heater. You said, so it's every word that proceeds out of your mouth, they will not return to you void. You said, but they will accomplish the purpose of which you have sent them. In Every life that is under this meeting, this word will accomplish God's purpose. Your marriage is starting afresh. Your husband is becoming a brand new husband. Your wife is becoming a brand new wife. New wine is beginning to flow in your marriage. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, every wall that the devil has built between you and your husband, between you and your wife, it collapsed tonight. Every middle wall of partition between you and your in-laws, I declare tonight the Lord demolish it. In the mighty name of Jesus, wherever the enemy has been attacking your financial empowerment, arise from tonight in the name of Jesus. The Lord bless the work of your hands. In the name of Jesus Christ, Every door of provision that has been closed against you before now, it is open now in the name of Jesus. Jesus said, I am the one that had the key of David in my hands. I open a door, no man can shut it. I shut a door, no man can open it. I declare from tonight, the door of abundant provision is open to you in the name of Jesus. Solomon had a vineyard. The wife said, I also have a vineyard. The two of them were productive. I declare over your life now the power of productivity. The Lord release upon your life in the name of Jesus. I declare it shall be well with you. <laughs> in the mighty name of Jesus, what you need to take care of your surviving parents before they die, the Lord release into your hands. In the name of Jesus. Even those parents that have offended you and because they offended you, you have turned your back against them. Yes. I hear the Lord saying tonight. <laughs> yes. I hear the Lord saying forgive them and take care of them. Receive that grace in the name of Jesus. Thank you, our Father. Thank you for this foundation. As you bring us tomorrow and we are building on unraveling this mystery, please take us deeper. We bless your name, Father. In Jesus' name we have prayer.